Let's get into Gridless then. Let's get into your project. Uh, explain in detail again what Gridless is. Uh, I know we covered this a little bit at the start, but I kind of want to dig into it now. Yeah. So, you know, we started off um, just looking at different energy um, and the mix of it. And, you know, there's there's opportunities to go after some of the larger energy generation and um, grid connected energy if you wanted to in Africa. Um, but the real benefit of, of Gridless is going to the places that are not well connected, that don't have a good grid. So we found mini grid providers and we started just calling a bunch of them all over East and Southern Africa and saying, hey, tell us about your, your problems. And so this would be solar, wind, hydro. Uh, geothermal tends to be bigger, so we weren't dealing with geothermal at the time. Can you explain what a mini grid is? Yeah. So we, we started talking to these mini grid providers who were all over the continent. And mini grid providers to us, um, there's no really good definition of it, but we tend to think of them as people who are developing energy product projects that are probably under two megawatts. So... Um, and oftentimes under one. Um, so we would, we would, we found out that when they were going in and building it, they had to overbuild for the community um, for two reasons. One, because the usage of the community over time will go up and they need to be ready for it. And two, um, if you're doing wind or solar, you have a certain amount of, of, of energy generation during the day, but only a certain amount of use. And the use during the daytime is very low in these communities, and the use in the mornings and the evenings is, is higher. So, you know, you have to build enough that you can, you can have enough for those periods. And that meant they have a ton of stranded energy. Like, the energy is, is going to waste. It's sitting there, and it's literally being wasted. And it's being turned into heat and dissipated. And so we said, we have a better way of turning into heat and dissipating it. Let's put a Bitcoin miner on it. And um, then we can pay you for it. And so um, we found a partner who was willing to give it a try. We tested it out, and, and, and it really works. And if you've, if you've seen any of the stuff we've done online, um, one of the first sites we set up was, uh, you know, it's about a 50-kilowatt uh, site. And the community around it, it was using 20 kilowatts of it during the day. And so that left 30 kilowatts uh, for us to access, which is, you know, maybe six miners. So we set up six miners inside there. And um, and then um, at night we would be like, what what happened to the energy? This is hydro. I should start with that. This is a small mini hydro site of fifty kilowatts. And you know, at night it would all you know half our miners would just shut off. We're like, what is going on? We had no idea what was going on. And um, so finally we went to the site and we were talking to the engineers. He's like, oh yeah, well you know between six and ten in the evening. Um, people use more energy, so we need to we need to use about 15 more kilowatts. So I just I go out down there and flick off your switch, <laughs> and we're like, oh, um, okay. Well, you know, now that we know that, we can do that remotely. In fact, we can automate it, so you don't have to walk down that steep hill in the dark and and flick a switch. And if it's raining, slip and slide down it. And these are steep, muddy hills too. And so he's, he was really happy with that. We and we turned on this kind of auto curtailing of a mini grid in you know in the middle of a very agricultural belt of rural Kenya. There's very little difference fundamentally what you're doing with these mini grids than say Hive is doing uh, in Texas. Well, I mean, I would say that uh, besides the orders of magnitude um, and the ability to get paid when we're curtailing the power, like we don't get paid when we curtail. But, but it's the same kind of scenario, right? It, you're, you're making a grid more efficient. Yeah, so I think there's two things going on. There's, there's yes, you're making the grid more efficient, um, but you're also providing sustainability. So if you if you think, I had never seen this kind of a I call it a win 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 situation. So when we when we were talking to the mini grid providers, you know, we, we called up dozens of them all over the continent, and um, they have a really big problem with sustainability. It costs a fair whack of money to put one of these um, sites together. And then they have to charge a certain amount for it. So there's some solar sites where they're charging 90 cents a kilowatt to rural users who don't have much disposable income, 90 cents. In Kenya and Nairobi, we're paying 22 cents pre-tax on our energy, which is still fairly high, right? Um, and, you know, in places in the U.S., you'll pay 10 cents um, or less. And um, so it's, it's, I mean, 90 cents for a rural African user is, is, is incredibly high. And we asked them, well, why is that? that? That doesn't seem like if you're there to kind of bring energy to people and you're putting in a hundred kilowatt solar site, how does that even make sense? 
And like, we just, we have to make our return on investment. And so we have to charge this much and we have a bunch of wasted energy. Um, so what happens when, when a Bitcoin miner comes in, we buy that excess. And so it helps make the, the mini grid themselves more sustainable because they're getting so three, five times the money they were getting before. And, um, and that brings the third win, which is not up to us. It is up to the energy provider, uh, the, the mini grid themselves. They can decrease the cost to the end user. So in the communities that we've been working in, they have done that. They can drop the price from 35 cents before we got there to kind of more like what it is in Nairobi. So 22 to 25 cents today. And, you know, that's, that makes a significant change in somebody's life. So you have a win for us. We're mining Bitcoin. You have a win for the, the energy generation, the mini grid, um, because they're able to sell all their power now. And you have a win for the community because they have a more power, more efficient power and cheaper power. And one of these sites, these, uh, these mini grid sites, what kind of size community are they serving? And what's the, what is the local economy in these places? Is it mainly farming? Yeah, it's hugely agricultural around here. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be opening up a site pretty soon in, in, in southern Africa um, that I, I think is agricultural as well. Um, but there's more mining sites and other other industries down there that are in those rural areas. Uh, but in our areas, it's all it's all agriculture. And um, and so, yeah, with a with a site that is, you know, 50 kilowatts, you'll, you'll probably have about 500 um, connections to it in the in the community. Um, you know, and uh, there's more connections. You can you could actually build that grid out further if you had more power. Uh, so that's one of the things that's happened. Um, the second site that we went into was actually just a little way up the same river. And they put another runner river site, um, a mini grid site there. And that has 500 kilowatts of, uh, of energy, um, in which we use about 60% for Bitcoin mining. So 300 kilowatts for Bitcoin mining. Yeah. So, in, uh, so in those scenarios, like in, in a 50 kilowatt site, we'll have six miners on shelves inside of the, the energy site next, right next to the turbine, right? And um, in a 500 kilowatt site, we'll have a container sitting next to the site that has more miners in it and the connectivity to the internet and things like that. What is the upfront investment cost to build one of these mini grids? And I know it will change depending on the, the size of the output. So it's, I actually think this is maybe one of the biggest things that need to change. So that's a fantastic question. So our partners, if they're building a mini grid, that's 200 kilowatts, that's going to charge them about $4,000. It's going to cost them about $4,000 per kilowatt to build. If they're building something that's about 10 times bigger, so 1.9 megawatts, that will cost them about $1,000 a kilowatt to build just because of economies of scale. So I think one of the biggest advantages that Bitcoin mining can bring is a new energy development where we can come alongside as a partner for somebody who's trying to build more energy into further off places. So move the grid even further out to the edges. And we can say, listen, you're going to build a 200 or 500 meg, you know, kilowatt site. Why don't you build something that's one to one and a half, maybe two? Uh, we'll help bring the financing alongside for that. And then the Bitcoin mining will backstop the financing of that for the first however many years until it's paid off. And I think that is the is, is one of the biggest promises of, of, of electricity generation across Africa that I've seen in my whole life. Yeah, the reason I ask, because it feels like that is a initial investment that could be uh, high tens, but possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get the site operational to serve an agricultural community of maybe 500 connections. And so I was just wondering of the economics of it. For you know, It seems like a very tough market. Yeah, you've talked about these communities maybe having people who don't have a lot of money, aren't paid a lot. I mean, I might be wrong here. These 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 farm these farms these agricultural areas might you know do okay economically, but it still feels like a tough business. You would think so, right? Um, but remember, if you have a if you have an off taker, an energy off taker who can provide you a base level um, for fifty percent of that or more, then you're actually in a very good position. So um, you had Brandon Quintum on earlier, uh, I think it was in December maybe. And he had, a, you know, he talks about, you know, uh, Bitcoin miners coming in and creating um, space for new things to happen, right? For, for yeah. other types of activity to come on board. And I think that is very much what happens here. It's like with more energy um, and access to it, with more affordable energy, then people do more. I'm, I'm really on that, Eric. Um, 
as you drive the price of energy down for the people in the community that are sort of close to the grid that are operational now, presumably their usage of energy will increase. So what does Gridless plan to do when that happens? Is it like you move on and you seed a project somewhere else and kind of grow it again? Or do you actually grow out the grid in the same location? So our partners grow out the grid in the same location further. What we do is the more energy that's needed by the community and small businesses, then we decrease our usage of miners and we move them. And that's written into our contracts. And in terms of the kind of testing work you're doing with this at the moment, how, how well is this working? So it's working really well um, sometimes, and then other times it just like falls apart. So like, um, God, was it four days ago, three days ago, we lost uh, internet connection at uh, one of our sites uh, for 13 hours. And so our miners were sitting there mining away the whole time, and um, we didn't earn a single, you know, Bitcoin or sat for it. And um, it's frustrating because that's something that, you know, we know quite a bit about connectivity, internet connectivity, and, um, and that, but we just didn't have anybody there. We hadn't built the redundancy for connection into that site yet. And uh, so sometimes you have those issues. Um, we've come across other, you know, this is where when you're in the trenches, it's different than in theory land, um, where, you know, the, the, the rainfall this year was really poor in, in Kenya. So that means we're getting less water into the turbines which means that, again, the community gets first take and then we get the next. So we haven't actually been able to run our 300 kilowatt site at 300 kilowatts um, for the last three weeks. Um, we've been running it at 100, which means that a, you know only a third of our miners are running in that site. So we're now moving them to other sites so that they get more usage. Uh, you know, So in reality, I think what we're, we're finding is that you have to be able to, first of all, build a very lean operation uh, with people who can figure things out on the fly, on the ground as they happen. Two is then build processes and systems in, that you can make sure that strengthen you to take to make sense of these variables, again, which is not, not an abnormal thing for us to have to deal with. But you have to build that into your organization and, um, and your operations. And um, I think as we're kind of figuring out that business operations side of things, it's going to level out. Um, but it's going to always have some variability to it. The, um, I'll tell you another interesting story. I, I, you know, the, I think the biggest, I think they're the biggest Bitcoin miner in Africa, um, is, um, big block data center out of the Congo. I don't know if you've ever talked to Sebastian. Sebastian's the French guy who started it and, um, they run, I think it's five megawatts of old, um, really kind of like S9 kind of miners in, um, in uh in the Virunga forest and um it's uh it's a really amazing setup it's a great setup it helps support um the the you know the the gorillas and everything that are in the park right there it's a it's a very fantastic program but you know he was telling me a story at the africa bitcoin conference this year about how they have to they have to deal with electricity um uh, specifically lightning so lightning strikes in the mountains are, 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 are really, they're very consistent. They happen all the time, and it also brings down things all the time. So they have to control for that. They have to sometimes turn off all their, their they have to curtail all of what they do until the lightning goes away. You have things like that, environmental factors that are maybe, maybe a little different than what you'd find in, you know, the other places that are doing a lot of Bitcoin mining. But um, I think as we get, as we get to time, as we come to terms with the environmental issues that we have to deal with at a mini grid level, or even what what Sebastian is doing at Big Block Data Center, you know, you 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 start to build new things, you build new ways of managing it. Um, we've been building software now that can, you know, there's software already that runs the miners. The Foreman is this really good software that we use to manage our miners. And then there's the software that's used to kind of see what's going on with the turbines or with the solar power, or whatever it is, but they don't talk to each other. Right. So we're, we're already thinking about like, what are this, what's the pieces of software we need to write so they can speak to each other to do the auto curtailing and, and base load management um, in these locations. I think there's going to be a whole bunch of innovation around the Bitcoin mining space that comes from Africa because we have to deal with it in a very different way.